Well, I was thinking about trying to give this message in a voice similar to the one that James used earlier because it was so awesome, but I didn't think I could pull that off. So, um, so uh, who likes awkward conversation? <laughs> who likes awkward conversations about this stuff? James does? Actually. <laughs> That's fantastic. So I had asked you guys to, to talk about some questions earlier in your small group, and I'm just curious to hear what you guys came up with. So what does our culture say about, about sex? It says it's great. says it's great. Whatever you feel is right. Whatever you feel is right. How would we want to make people happy? Happiness in the moment? With everybody. With anybody, anybody or everybody? <laughs> anybody, okay. Uh, as long as everyone's okay with it, go for it. As long as everyone's okay with it, go for it. Yeah, these are common, and you see, who has seen probably, uh, in the last month, who has seen some kind of sexual image, not saying like pornography, but just seen like on television or media, something that uh, gave the appearance of sexuality in some fashion, in the last month? <laughs> Anybody in the last week? Yeah. Last day? Hopefully not the last hour, but today? <laughs> so, so it's very common and pervasive, and there is, a, there is basically an agenda behind that. The, the world is, and culture is trying to convince everyone within it that uh, everything is okay, there are no rules, uh, nothing bad can happen from it, everybody's doing it. Um, uh, it's nothing but good things that come from that. Uh, what does the Bible say, or what does God say about that, about sex? Do you have anything to say? Yeah. It's a good thing inside of marriage, absolutely. Who created sex? God did, exactly. So, is it, is it, could God have created something that was bad that way. And it'd be intentional about it and it'd be bad. I, I don't think so. Uh, what else does God say about it? One man and one woman. One man and one woman, absolutely. <laughs> Good. Well, let's talk about that a little further then. Um, so yeah, so uh, it's pretty clear that God has intentions for a man and a woman to uh, come together in marriage and to have sex. Um, and that's pretty clear. Uh, and so you see that actually in Genesis 2, 18 through 25, uh, that's um, when God is, sees that man is alone and creates woman to be his partner, and at the end says, and that's why man and woman will, well, man will leave his, his family and uh, join together with his wife to become one flesh, which is essentially a way of saying that they have, they have sex. Uh, in Genesis 9, uh, God is talking to Noah and Noah's children, and says, be fruitful and multiply. Is it possible for humanity to multiply in any kind of asexual way? No, so it's pretty obvious that the intention is that, that men and women will be in a relationship, be married, and, and, and have sex. Um, so the question though is, what was God's purpose in sex? Was it all just about procreation? Or were, would, would there be other purposes for it? And to me, it seems pretty clear that there are other purposes for it. So Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, uh, depending upon which, uh, how it's labeled in your Bible, uh, is an entire book devoted to two young people who are madly in love, um, and talks about the physical aspects of that love. Oh, you. <laughs> um, so eight chapters full of that, and some people actually find it kind of embarrassing because it's fairly graphic at times. Um, but it is about, it is about, uh, within the confines of marriage, so these are married people, newly married people, and, and sex. So the Bible has a whole book on that. Um, so one of the interesting things is Song of, of Songs, or Song of Solomon, does not actually contain any mention of children in it. As in, he's not, they're not talking about sex in, in, uh, with respect to having kids, they're talking about it just in terms of being married. Um, and so I think that it's pretty clear that God intended for sex to be fun and pleasurable. Um, here's where it gets awkward, right? Um, but he also talks about the procreation part, as I said, about being fruitful and multiplying. He talks about oneness, so the act of sex bringing two people together in a certain sort of oneness, um, uh, physically, 
um, and spiritually and emotionally, actually, um, that you don't see through other forms of, of relationship. Um, and it creates an intimacy. And I know if you were here last week, Kyle drew on, on the board three concentric circles, and the innermost one was intimacy. So you had the outer ring of people who, uh, what was it? It was influence. What's that? Concern. Concern and then influence, right? If I remember right. And then intimacy was the innermost one. Um, and ideally, uh, intimacy is a state where you are in a relationship with somebody where you don't have any fear of rejection or judgment. Um, and so you're free to be exactly who you are without any kind of concern. And sex actually produces that, but it's also a result of that. Um, and then Paul talks later on about, uh, in, in some of his letters, about how it's a protection from temptation. Uh, as in, if you cannot remain celibate, then you should be married, because it's within that relationship that you can have, you, you should be having sex. Um, what does the Bible say, or what does God say about sex outside of marriage? Not to do it. <laughs> not, not to do it. It's a nice way of summing it up. Um, so, 1 Thessalonians, uh, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. And sexual immorality is, is, a, is a grouping of, of things that really contains all things uh, sexual outside of marriage. So that would either be uh, sex with people you're not married to, as in you're currently married to somebody and you're having sex with somebody other than that, or uh, sex when uh, when you are not married and they're not married. Um, sex, having sex with a person who is married but you're not also would fall within that. So basically all things not sex within marriage is lumped together in sexual immorality in a number of places throughout the Bible. Um, it talks about not doing that um, and also, certainly not taking advantage of a, of a brother or sister, um, you know, one of your uh, fellow Christians, uh, fellow Christian believers. Um, and when I see when I see rules, I'm I'm a cynic, I'm skeptical, and I tend to ask, why does who who here has ever been told by a parent to do something, and you're like, no, I don't want to, and why would that be? Why would I have to? Who's ever who's ever questioned their parents on their silly rules? I don't see anybody back there. Um, so, so why, why does God have rules? So my, my, one of my fundamental questions is always, why does God have rules at all? Why not just let everybody do whatever they want to? Um, and God, I th as, as I see it, there's three main reasons. One is that uh, he's identifying for us what's right and wrong. So God is good by his very nature, and so out of that comes... Uh, expectations of what right and wrong are. It's not that he's creating right and wrong, it's not that he is just recognizing what's right and wrong because that's out there, so much as he is the definition of right and wrong by his very character uh, and very nature. Um, so he's, help, he's giving us a roadmap to what's right and also, by contrast, what's wrong. Um, he's, the rules are there, uh, meant to be there, because they're good for us. So if your parent tells you, uh, not to touch the stove or touch the hot pan that just came off of the stove when you're a small child, the reason for that is, you know, the rule is there to keep you from getting burned. Um, or don't cross the street without looking both ways and keep you from getting run over. So it's, they're there to, to help protect you from the bad things that can happen. Um, but God's rules are also there to set people apart. So sometimes it's a little, a little less obvious about why uh, he would have such a rule, but sometimes it really is just you are my people, so you wouldn't do this, and that separates you from people who are not uh, his people. Um, and if, let, let's say your parent is giving you a rule saying, don't do this, or you must do this, depending upon the rule, um, and they don't give you an explanation, is that an easier rule to follow or a harder rule to follow? I think those are hard, for me, those are harder to follow. If I can't understand why the rule is there, it makes me want to not follow the rule. I'll be honest. Um, but fortunately, uh, the Bible, God's Word, gives us plenty of opportunities to see why the rules are the way they are. Um, and so 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about this. <clears throat> he says, uh, Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. 
Do you not know that your, your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins, or sexually immoral man, sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Uh, so there's a few things in here. If he's saying that uh, if you steal something, uh, if you um, if you lie, if you murder somebody, those are all committed to other people. You know, there, you might suffer consequences as a result, but ultimately, but the initial thing is actually an offense against somebody else. You've stolen their thing, you've hurt them, uh, you've lied to them. But when you sin sexually, you actually are harming yourself directly as well. Um, and really, those are the only sins that that follow that rule. So um, that separates it in some ways from from the other sins. Um, <clears throat> he's also uh, pointing out that you are part of the body of Christ. You and your body are part of the body of Christ. So you are uh, a part of Him, and anything you do to yourself, then you ultimately are doing doing to Him. And out of your respect and love for Him and the salvation that we have, we should treat our bodies. Uh, in a way that's respectful of, of God's love and sacrifice for us. Um, I, so I, I am a, fa I'm a family physician, and I love science, and I think I've said this before a number of times when I talk to you, uh, but I am always uh, greatly appreciative when the science actually backs up exactly what God says, and you see this over and over and over again if you read the Bible and you read what science has discovered. Um, and so there are a few things that has been pretty well shown happen to people, especially teenagers, when they have sex outside of marriage. Now, what did you guys come up with? What are the consequences? What happens to people when they have sex outside of marriage? Children, Children sexually transmitted infections. Anything else? What's that? That's it. Emotional damage. Mental yeah, feelings yeah. of regret, depression. Regret, depression, emotional damage. What did I hear over here? Mental deficiency. I guess what they said is how much Good? Um, yes? Suicide, yeah. Abortion. Abortion? Um, it makes your future relationships harder. <coughs> um, makes future relationships harder. Yeah, those are great thoughts. And, and so let's look at some of these things. And if you want references to them, I can I can provide them. I have not put them in the in the slides, but um, so relationship or, or intimate partner violence is actually uh, signif significantly higher in people who have uh, sex outside of marriage. It doesn't mean that you don't see domestic violence within marriage, uh, but it almost always starts when people are having sex outside of marriage. And domestic violence, uh, uh, or sexual violence anyway, rarely occurs in a relationship until after there's been some kind of uh, sexual contact. Um, and uh, teenagers in particular who are sexually active are at a much higher risk than the entire rest of the population for uh, some kind of intimate partner violence. So it, it does happen. Um, school performance declines. Drugs, alcohol, and smoking are increased. I just kind of like this picture. Got another brain on drugs, I suppose. Um, but it, it, so it's, it's interesting that people who engage in, and this is so teenagers who engage in sex uh, have a higher risk of drugs, alcohol, and smoking. So uh, boys are affected uh, differently than girls, actually. So uh, a boy who engages in, in sex as a teenager is six times more likely to uh, use drugs and alcohol and four times more likely to, to smoke. So girls are more or less likely to, to be affected by this, do you think? More, actually. So girls are ten, girls who engage in, in, in sex as a teenager are ten times more likely to use uh, drugs and alcohol than people who don't. Uh, and they're seven times more likely to smoke tobacco. Uh, so these are real things. And you know, I do take care of patients. I, take, I, have, I have newborns in my practice. I have, uh, saw a 91-year-old today as well. So I take care of people across the lifespan, and I, I think that's really fun. But uh, one of the great joys is seeing young children grow up, and, and you get to see them mature. And uh, so I remember it was a few years ago I, I met a 14-year-old girl who was bright and smiley and interactive and she was an A-B student in school and she was involved in soccer and 
interested in volleyball and you know great person easy to talk with um, not in any relationships but some of her friends were in relationships nobody was none of her friends were having sex uh, the next year when I saw her for a complete physical uh, she uh, had started dating but they were not particularly physical she did have a couple friends who were, were having sex and she was uh, concerned because uh, some of them were not doing well and had actually broken up and had multiple multiple uh, relationships and multiple partners she didn't want that to happen to her um, and so we talked about that uh, the next year I saw her she was 16 um, and she was a very different person so she had kind of a almost that dark cloud over the top of her head didn't make any eye contact um, was clearly depressed um, and had actually now been in two relationships both of which uh, since the one that I, I had talked to her last year about both of which had she had had sex during um, and she was concerned about sexually transmitted infections she had actually had a pregnancy scare her persona was very different uh, one year later is that all related to sex I can't say that but clearly she was a very different person just one year later um, having done that there was a patient back when I was a resident so this was 20 years ago um, who was a 12 year old girl who's all of her friends she had a group of four friends and they were all pregnant I was just like, what? Were they all 12? Yes, a bunch of 12 year olds. And she was a bright, yes, she was a, she was bright. She was an AB student again. Um, but she, and so we, we talked about, we talked about birth control. We talked about not being in relationships until you're ready. We talked about not having sex. Um, and we talked about prenatal vitamins. If you were going to engage in those things, because if you're going to be sexually active, there's a chance you could get pregnant. Um, she declined the birth control pill, and I got a call six weeks later that she was pregnant. And it is heartbreaking to see this otherwise young woman who had all this potential in the world, um, who seemed to be doing quite well, and then uh, when I saw her two years later, was the next time I saw her, uh, she was about ready to drop out of school. She had had her baby and was trying to raise that with her mom, but they were both living in poverty. Um, and her life was very, very different. And there are real consequences to, to some of these things. Um, infections, we talk about infections. So what is this a picture of, anybody know? Uh, it is from the bloodstream. So the white, is the pointer work? So the white curly cues are actually a certain kind of bacteria in the bloodstream. So syphilis, this is what it looks like. A uh, little spiral corkscrew-shaped bacteria on the rise, actually. Syphilis is making a, 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 a valiant comeback after being uh, quite well controlled for a while. And why is that? It's a sexually transmitted infection. So um, these things are real. And you hear about syphilis, oh, that's, that doesn't really happen. It actually does. Um, and if you don't treat it, it leads to early dementia. It starts eating holes in your brain. It's a, it's a terrible thing. So. Uh, HIV, all of those things. So, I, I mean, I see these things. They do happen in the Fox Valley. Teen pregnancy. I mean, we talked about a couple cases before about that. But teen pregnancy has an impact on on, on the, the woman who is pregnant. It has, a, has an impact on, obviously, the, uh, the father. Um, but it has an impact on, on uh, future generations as well. There's actually some great studies, which are actually terrible studies, but they're really well done, and they show that if you are if you are a teen mom who is a now teen mom you have about a 50 percent chance of living the rest of your life in poverty 50 mm percent -hmm. I, I think that's stunning and sad um, if you are a boy born to a teen mom that boy has a 75 percent chance of living in poverty the rest of his life and if you are a boy born to a teen mom who lives in poverty while she's a teen mom, that boy has about a 90% chance <clears throat> excuse me, of living in poverty the rest of his life. These have real implications for the people that are involved <clears throat> that I think are quite quite sad in, 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 in many tragic ways. Uh, girls, for some reason, actually, the girls born from teen moms do have a higher risk of poverty, uh, but it's not the same. Uh, apparently, girls can escape that, that uh, sentence in some ways. Um, they didn't really, in the study when I was reading it, didn't really talk about exactly why that is, but uh, I think these are stunning statistics, actually. Um, there's also 
uh, growing body of evidence that that the children born from teen moms and you can do well and so if any of you are have a, have a parent who was was a teenager when you were born people can do well it's just there's a higher risk of behavioral problems especially among boys born to teen moms and that includes uh, trouble with the law violence uh, dropping out of school um, so so there are there are consequences to that uh, I heard people talking about emotional changes so depression and anxiety often go hand in hand with that. It's about a two-fold higher risk of depression and anxiety among uh, teenagers who are engaged in, in sex. Uh, suicide rate is twice as high, and the attempts rate is twice as high. Um, and self-esteem drops. Uh, when they, they rate people's self-esteem, their self-esteem is lower when they're, when they have, once they have had sex. And the, the, 